Over half the counties in the United States do not have an OBGYN. Infant mortality rates for African Americans in some areas are increasing. In Uganda, we lose about 16 mothers every day in labor. And one of the major constraints is lack of human resources for health. Across the 57 countries with a critical shortage of trained health workers, an estimated 1 billion people have no access to health care. Among developing countries, India is one of the biggest exporters of trained physicians to the Western world. Every year, the United States turns away tens of thousands of qualified applicants from American nursing, pharmacy, medical, and other health professional schools. At the same time, we import tens of thousands of health workers from some of the poorest and sickest countries in the world. 70% of the Ugandan doctors and 80% of the Ugandan pharmacists and 40% of the nurses and midwives are located in urban areas serving only 12% of the population. Difficult living and working conditions, such as lack of water and electricity, irregular supplies and equipment, and professional isolation make health workers avoid working in rural areas. There is a critical shortage of not only healthcare workers, but also training programs in rural India. Good morning, I'm Dr. Kate Telenko, and I'm the Senior Director for Health Systems Innovation at IntraHealth and I've seen the global health worker shortage and maldistribution from both sides of the ocean. As a practicing pediatrician in the United States, I've seen my government underinvesting in American youth, particularly in underserved communities such as the African American and Latino communities and rural communities. As the director of Capacity Plus, which is the US government's largest health workforce program, I've seen health professional schools and clinics emptied of their health workers. And that's one of the reasons I wrote my book, InSourced, about the connection between the US and the global health worker shortage. And today we want to start a conversation, and um, I'll have the panelists introduce themselves, but in short, we have a health worker who chose to stay, we have a global um, retention professional, global retention expert, and we have a health worker uh, who chose to migrate. I'm Dr. Grace Namaganda, a dental surgeon by basic training, now a practicing health manager and a human resources for health specialist. I'm currently the deputy chief of party of the Uganda Capacity Program, whose main mandate is to support the ministries of health and districts in Uganda to actually manage, efficiently manage their human resources for better health service delivery. Good morning, my name is Wanda Jaskowitz. I've had the privilege of working with IntraHealth International for the last 16 years. I'm a senior team leader for global leadership and health workforce effectiveness on the Capacity Plus project. And my main area of focus in human resources for health system strengthening is to assist countries to improve health worker retention and productivity. Good morning, my name is Abhay Agarwal. I'm a board certified internal medicine physician. I completed my medical school training in Bombay, India in the early 1990s and I migrated to USA in 1994. After completing my residency and fellowship in Pennsylvania, I moved to North Carolina, where I'm practicing as an uh, internal medicine physician. I'm also the deputy medical director for the Department of Public Safety here in North Carolina. So Grace, could you please share with us the Ugandan experience as far as key factors of what makes health workers stay and what makes them leave? I'll share my experience based on our a nearly 10 years of work in uh, supporting the Ministry of Health in Uganda to manage their human resources for health. We have learned that a number of factors actually determine what motivates the health worker and what, where he chooses to work or stay. But one of the cross-cutting factors is the, actually the work environment. People want to have the facilities to use. They want decent working conditions and good leadership and I think to demonstrate this, I will share my own experience. About 13 years ago when I left school, I was very enthusiastic. I wanted to actually practice as a dental surgeon, and I wanted to do it in the best facility available. So at that time, the best facility was a military hospital. And to be able to practice there, you had to be a military person. I actually joined the military, came out, 
and um, was a military officer as well as a dental surgeon. And this was very prestigious uh, because it was held in high esteem. And my pay was very good. I had all the conditions I needed to motivate me. But my work, I did not have the facilities to actually work and practice as a dental surgeon. So for years, for about five years, I worked there. But I was inside, I felt demotivated because I could not practice what I had learned. So I chose to actually leave and join the private sector because there you would have the facilities to work. And that's how I ended up in the NGO world. Okay, thank you. And Wanda, to stop health workers from leaving rural areas or from leaving their country, why don't countries just increase salaries? That's a great question. I think that's what a lot of people think. Just throw more money at them, and of course that will, that will be enough. But I think as Grace gave us her own personal example, that really upon completion of their training, health workers really have choices in where they can work. Will they go to a, do they want to work in a rural area? Do they prefer to be in an urban environment? What are the conditions you would find in each of those places? Do, will you work in the public sector? Will you go to the private sector? Where, do you want to work in a big hospital, or do you prefer a smaller clinic to really get your hands, you know, your hands on, on training after you finish school? So those are some of the areas that, that need to be looked at. And of course, salary, while definitely important, is only one of the, the choices, one of the characteristics that health workers take into account when they're making their employment decisions. You have to look at what motivates someone to work in a specific in a specific area, what can, you, what can you provide them? Motivation is influenced by a very complex interplay of economic, social, and professional factors. So you need to find what is the mix of, the, of those different factors that will motivate someone. There's no single intervention that will get people to work in, a, in an area that is difficult. And not all rural areas look like Saxapaha, as you see here. The conditions that Grace described are really what, what is found. So what can you do to overcome that rural areas have certain conditions? It takes years and decades to address some of the infrastructure issues that yesterday we had seen in many of those wonderful photos. You saw what the roads looked like, you saw what the environment was. So what can you do in the meantime to get health workers to accept those somewhat more difficult living conditions if you provide them with other um, aspects that you can, that will motivate them to go. What would you be willing to, to trade off? And there are many, many things you could do to get health workers to a rural area. The World Health Organization recently published recommendations of over 16 different interventions across the areas of education, regulation, financial incentives, and personal and professional support. You can look at long-term strategies such as having training schools in rural areas and recruiting students from those same rural areas. It's been shown that people from rural areas, if they train in rural areas, then want to stay and keep working in their hometowns near, near, to, what they, near to what they know. Those are some long-term strategies. In the meantime, if you need shorter-term strategies, you could look at what are different incentive packages, what are different aspects you can provide in terms of career advancement, financial incentives, you, you, you know, increasing salary, uh, training opportunities, et cetera. And Abe, could you please share with us some of the push and pull factors that might influence uh, Indian physicians to migrate to the US? Sure, Kate. Um, India is a very large country with a huge population and some unique challenges. Um, there has been a very consistent brain drain from India um, over the past many years. Initially started with the technology boom and then gradually moved over to other professions such as healthcare workers, businessmen, and scientists. Um, there is a very uh, long-standing and strong belief in India that training outside of India is, is not only superior but also a mark of achievement. Also, many, um, um, most of the physicians who graduate from India do not want to practice in uh, primary care or as a family physicians, as that is not looked upon very favorably in the physician community in India. And there simply are not enough uh, graduating, post-graduating programs in India to absorb all the uh, graduating uh, medical students. Uh, so the lure of you know, better economic conditions, uh, the, the uh, promise of more technologically advanced training in, in developed worlds, as well as you know, an escape from 
the bureaucratic and chaotic conditions that sometimes ex that exist in India and the large population that, that we have over there uh, really um, entice people to migrate um, to other countries. In my cases, of course, you know, these were some of the reasons, some of the push and pull factors that, that made me move here. In addition, uh, on a more personal note, uh, my siblings were, had both emigrated here already, and that also uh, was a great factor in my uh, migration here. Thank you. And so, Grace, what do you consider in Uganda to be some of the main retention factors in, in rural or underserved areas? Okay, based on our experience, we've learned that actually it is a mix that will actually, a mix of package of uh, motivation and retention strategies that will actually attract and retain people in rural areas. And uh, for example, for doctors, it is very important to them to actually have limited stay in a rural area. In Uganda, the health service delivery system is decentralized where doctors, I mean, where districts can actually recruit and retain health workers on their own. And districts are finding it very difficult to get doctors because doctors don't want to go to one district and stay there for the rest of their life. They are actually defining it as a, the, bad, the caged bird syndrome where they feel like they're in a cage forever. For pharmacists, we've learned that to them, it is very important to go to a district where they will be able to have private practice so that they can supplement their income. For nurses and midwives, it is very important for them on who their supervisor is, what support they get, and things like that. So what we came up with is uh, we used the, DC, uh, the discrete choice experiment tool where we determined the preferred benefit packages for each of these cadres, and that's what we are implementing. We've also learned, as um, Wanda said, that salary is not enough, because government is paying 30% a top-up allowance for rural settings, but people are not taking it on. Recently, government um, increased more than double the salary for doctors for rural settings, that is in lower-level health units, and out of only 41% of the doctors we needed actually took that. And that shows that salary alone is not enough incentive to actually move people. Now, Wanda, um, you know, one thing that we see in many countries is that the majority of health professionals, the students, are recruited from the major metropolitan areas, often from middle class or upper class families. So they don't have any desire to ever live in these rural areas, which might be from a different ethnic group, different religious group. So what could we do to change that? Well, there are a number of options. Some of them, of course, are a bit longer term. Um, as I said in, in the earlier remarks, it, People who are from rural areas obviously know rural areas. They have families who are living there, and they are more prone to stay and work and serve the communities from which they grew up. So the more programs that can be located in rural areas, the more likely you, likelihood of having those graduates then want to work in rural areas. The problem is, in many countries, a lot of the training programs are located in urban environments, in the capital cities. Once you remove these rural individuals to a capital city and they spend a number of years there, they're a little you know, awed by the, the big city lights, or they get married, or they you know, realize that the, the conditions are somewhat more advantageous in urban areas. It is then difficult to attract them back to, to rural areas. Um, another way you can do, in some places you, you, know, you have to have of the schools in urban areas. At least then you could include in the training curriculum clinical practice internships in rural areas. So that it's a lot of students, what they've said is they can't even imagine what working in a rural area would be like. What, do, what would I do there? So if you, under supervision, during their schooling, show them what that is like and the opportunities and what it means to the communities and have them interact with communities and realize there, there's a great purpose here, then they are also more comfortable after graduation in maybe accepting, accepting a post. But I still do believe that you need to mix those longer term strategies with some of the methods used in, in Uganda and also provide other types of incentives. Because what health workers state is, you know, I can work in a rural area and I, I believe in this and I want to do this, but I still need other things while I'm there. You know, I don't like the professional isolation. Oftentimes people say going to a rural area is going to Siberia, you are lost. You are then not invited 
to trainings, for continuing education. Um, th those positions or career advancement opportunities are given to the people that the ministry sees on a regular basis, those who attend meetings. So you have to find ways as well to even reward them somewhat for taking these more difficult uh, positions and then allow them to have you know, first priority for, specialty, for specialized training. And what I think that Uganda has done that is so excellent is, as Tembi challenged us yesterday, they thought of the end user in mind. Where is the health worker in this? In Uganda, they went out and asked all the health workers, and not as one big lump either, but differentiating. Physicians have different motivational preferences. Nurses require different things. Pharmacists want something else. You can't also give a generalized package to everyone. If you're a new graduate, starting your career, your desires are one. If you're about to retire, you have different um, preferences. So you have to think of the end user, ask them what they want. And I remember an experience in one country where we were looking to design this sort of evidence-based incentive package, and one of the ministry officials said, oh, no, no, we don't need to waste time with these you know, statistical surveys and all this you know, economic modeling you do. I worked in a rural area 30 years ago. I know exactly what they want. You know, and, and I tried to give the example of, you know, they, these are different times. Let's actually ask the user. Thank you. Abhay, what do you see as the impact on your country of the immigration of large number of health workers? Um, Kate, that's a very good question. And the impact of, of migration to the Western countries is not very clear. What, however, is clear is there's a big divide in India uh, between the rural areas and the urban areas. While the urban areas enjoy a fairly decent uh, physician population, the rural areas are facing a healthcare, uh, critical healthcare shortage. Um, interestingly, in, in the last few years, many new private medical colleges have mushroomed up in India. Uh, again, uh, these are very high tuition, very expensive medical schools located primarily in the urban cities. And, and uh, just like uh, um, Wanda mentioned, they do not, the, the physicians graduating from these uh, medical colleges do not want to go back and practice in the rural, in the rural areas, but stay in the urban uh, countries. I'm sure my migration here certainly did not help this situation. And while the, while the Indian authorities are slowly becoming aware of this and, and taking some steps, I've not seen any, any major policy changes uh, to, to stem uh, the tide. Again, um, uh, it's been really difficult for my parents uh, back home in India since all, all the siblings have moved here into the U.S. Thank you. And all of uh, the panelists wanted to leave uh, the audience with you know, one or two actions that each of you potentially uh, could do to, to address this issue. So for me, you know, one of the things we need to do is in the United States, we need to address public education funding with where the jobs are and invest in our young people and train them to be healthcare workers. I also think we need to gradually reduce the amount of recruitment we do from health workforce crisis countries. The WHO defines countries on a scale of, of how bad the health workforce crisis country, uh, how bad the crisis is in that country. And we need to rely less on the, the crisis countries and if we are going to continue to import, import more from countries that have sufficient number of health workers. Um, I think my main recommendation would be for governments, especially when they are coming up with motivation and retention strategies, to think about how they will act to think about it more comprehensively, think about the public sector, PNFP sector, and private sector, and see what the impact of each of these packages will have on each of these sectors, so that we have a balanced uh, human resources in each of the sectors. And I would urge anyone who's looking at improving health worker retention or having more equitable distribution across urban and rural areas to really think of the end user, to really involve health workers in determining what their motivational incentive packages should be. I would urge that there be more medical schools, medical school, advanced medical school training in the rural areas so we can attract and retain healthcare workers in those locations. Thank you so much for your attention.